Today's video has been sponsored by Manta Sleep and their high quality sleep masks, which have been specifically designed to be comfortable and unobtrusive to help you get the best sleep possible. Their pressure free soft eye cups completely black out light, while the breathable, durable materials on the highly adjustable headband ensures that you stay comfy wumfy in any sleeping position. You can even swap out the head strap and eye cups to find the exact combo that fits you the best. The Manta Sound Mask also comes with super thin Bluetooth headphones so you can listen to whatever soothing sounds help you drift off to sleep, or to block out daytime noise if you're meditating or having an afternoon nap. Check out the Manta Sleep website and use the 10% discount code in the description and pinned comment below. Lasers! Pew pew! The modern tool with so many uses. They're in communications, industry, phones, they're everywhere. They've gotten so good, they're also now beginning to see widespread service in warfare and hold the potential to become a defining weapon of the future. Today, we're going to cover a very specific and exotic type, the nuclear laser. Firstly, a quick reminder of what a laser even is. They are beams of coherent light. That is, one where the photons it's made of are all the same and moving in the same direction. This means the beam stays as a beam over very long distances, or has a very specific frequency, or can be pulsed over extremely short lengths of time. All these features are what makes them so useful for the wide variety of applications they're used in. The equipment for lasers comes in three main parts. A source of photons, a lasing medium which copy-pastes those photons over and over to make into a coherent laser, and then optics to focus and point the resulting beam. Depending on the specifics of the technology, the first two parts can be combined. If you want more info on this and how they work as weapons, then we've done a couple of videos on exactly that. But today we're seeing how you can get a laser out of nuclear things, like bombs. The nuclear bomb pumped laser sounds pretty crazy, and well, it is. When a nuke goes off, it releases a huge flash of high energy photons, way up in the X-ray range. Normally, these go on to do nuclear weapon things, but if you put a rod of a lasing material right beside the bomb, you can capture the X-ray photons that hit the material, copy pasting them into more photons and turning them into an X-ray laser, which then zaps out the ends of the rod. All this was part of the excitingly named Project Excalibur back in the Cold War, where Edward Teller championed it as a way of defending against incoming ICBMs. The theory was that a defensively detonated nuclear bomb could pump dozens upon dozens of X-ray lasers, wiping out whole waves of incoming missiles and their apocalyptic payloads. One satellite or defensive missile taking out all of that seems like a good trade-off. This concept was even experimentally proved at the end of 1985 with the Goldstone Underground Nuclear Test, but the results didn't meet expectations, so there were no more tests. Also, you may have noticed the lack of the third part of laser equipment, the optics. These are difficult to make for x-rays because they're so high energy. All of these issues contributed to Project Excalibur being scrapped, leaving bomb-pumped lasers to the realm of sci-fi. But that's not the only type of nuclear laser. Just like how we don't need to be exploding fissionables to get useful power out of them, we don't need to explode them to get lasers out of them either. Now, I must give credit where it's due here. The rest of this video is based on this blog post by Matterbeam, so if you want a ton of juicy numbers and even more details to gorge upon, go read this. First, we're going to start with some methods of getting a laser basically directly out of a nuclear reactor by putting the lasing medium right on in there. One way of doing this is called wall pumping, where the fission fragments, the bits that come out of an unstable fissionable atom, bump into the atoms of a lasing gas. The fragments then transfer their energy to the lasing medium, which, uh, lasers. The problem is that these fragments are these big, heavy things and so can't get very far into the gas, so you need to really maximise the surface area of the reactor with lots of tiny channels through it. An alternative method called volumetric pumping uses bigger channels and adds helium-3 to the lasing gas. Unlike the big heavy fission fragments, neutrons spitting out of the fissile fuel can get really deep into the gas mixture, where the helium-3 absorbs them and in turn creates charged particles. Those particles then go on to energise the lasing portion of the gas. Lots of stages to go through there, and using the costly helium-3 doesn't seem worth it. If you feel like sacrificing a solid lasing medium to the god of radioactivity, then you can use semiconductor pumping. Just make a tasty sandwich out of highly enriched uranium, silicon and diamond. You know, things we all just have lying around. And voila, a laser that destroys itself. Wow! 
These solid reactor concepts are lame though. What about just using uranium fluoride gas, a really good and healthy sounding thing, and mix it with a lasing gas? Well that does work, but it just absorbs a lot of the laser that it makes. So how about mixing pure uranium that's been aerosolized or vaporized into the lasing gas? Still really safe and nice, especially as it's running at several thousand degrees, but the laser doesn't get absorbed now. Related to, but perhaps not quite as mad as those things, is the aerosol fluorescer reactor. In one of these, micrometer side particles of fissile fuel are suspended in a flowing moderator. Surrounding this high temperature fuel moderator junk juice is a mix of either xenon and fluorite or xenon and iodine, which catches fission fragments from the fuel and creates an excimer. What the hell is an excimer? An excited dimer, of course. What the hell is an excited dimer? Uh, very complicated. Well, you know how atoms have electrons whizzing around them and they play a role in what other atoms they can stick to to make molecules? When you excite an atom, which means to bump it into a higher energy state, that can shift where its electrons hang out, which in turn changes what the atom can stick to. And this can include things it normally wouldn't stick to, or would even be repelled from. So it's like an atom wearing beer goggles. Stick two of these together and you get an excimer. Armed with this knowledge, we go back to the nuclear thing. Fission fragments hit a gas mixture which turns into an excimer of that same gas. When the gas excimers wake up the morning after and return to their stable, separated state, they fluoresce very specific photons. That's an excimer laser. What a cool word! Of course, there's another way of getting a laser out of a nuclear reactor without tapping directly into the neutrons or fission fragments coming out of the fuel. This can be as simple as running it as the hot side of an electrical generator with steam turbines or something, but that's a bit boring. Instead, let's use the heat of the funny rock by using it more directly by collecting and shining it all onto a lasing medium like a crystal, turning that heat into a laser. This does present some challenges though, because a lot of the heat doesn't get turned into a laser because it just passes right through the crystal. The solution there is to surround the crystal in a hot tube that recycles the heat and passes it back through over and over. But then you've got to be careful not to get the crystal so hot that it melts. Speaking of melting, that's also a problem with the reactor itself. A solid core has an upper limit before what it's made out of turns into a puddle, so there's an upper limit on how much can be sent to the lasing medium. If this sounds familiar, that's because it's the same problem faced by nuclear thermal rocket engines that we've looked at in a previous video. And the solution here is the same as there. Liquid or even gas core reactors that run way hotter but are more technologically complex. No matter the path taken to make a nuclear laser, there's the unavoidable issue of waste heat. Whether it's creating a cold side for an electrical generator, or stopping your components from melting, there needs to be a cooling system. And yeah, I'm mentioning radiators AGAIN. Waste heat is like the biggest trade-off you get with the lasers, so it's important to remember. There's some other flaws too, like the wavelengths of the lasers coming out of a lot of these is way bigger than the x-rays of Project Excalibur. But there's some benefits too, like if your lasing medium is a ridiculously hot reactor core, then a counter laser isn't really going to hurt it. But the strongest benefit is just how cool these concepts sound. And as I said earlier, if you want more info on these, then please check out the original blog post by Matterbeam. You can support Space Dock by joining our Patreon, where you can get our Frigate, Fighter and Carrier design reference books, as well as one week early access to upcoming videos. Thanks to our supporters, and thank you for watching.